have you gotten a chance to talk to Michael Carlin? He was working with Russell Poole right before Russell Poole passed. And it seems like he's getting pushed outside of the conversation. Now we need to check out another part of Michael Carlin's theory. Reggie Wright Jr. and the allegedly dirty cops who he and Suge Knight was bringing into the inner circle of death row. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. You got a lot to cover up. Well, who do you think killed Tupac? I believe Orlando Anderson killed Tupac. Are Sharitha and Reggie Wright Jr. telling the truth? Michael Carlin doesn't think so. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. There we a lot to cover up. So guys. What's going on? Uh, Kading, Greg Kading is out. His lawyer won't let him do it, so. So we've been waiting around for Kading all day. And yeah, and he now he's not coming. No show. Really, I wanted to talk to him because there's so much to ask him. Yeah. But them theorists, they come up with all kind of make-believe. Message, then they come and talk to Buntry. He denies it and all of that, and they call me. They're a little rich. We, you know, you know, we don't believe you had anything to do with this anymore. So who, who's number one suspect when you hear police in Compton handcuff? Reggie Jr. Hmm. I'm throwing your hints. <laughs> I'm dry snitching like a motherfucker. About 9.30, I get a call from the captain of the sheriff's station, Cecil Rambo, who I knew personally and all, because he heard from the sergeant at the scene that the truck of the victim that had got shot at this gas station was registered to Reggie Wright. Uh, it didn't say of death row, although it was a death row vehicle in Reggie Jr.'s name. Was uh, The driver was shot at the scene and somebody ran. And I said, Cecil, how the heck I get here if I had anything? That ain't me. I'm throwing your hints. <laughs> I'm dry snitching like a motherfucker. Everybody started getting killed. That was in a whole entourage. I know. I Everyone. Hear you. I hear you. Okay. Everyone started Mac, getting killed. I mean, not Mac, but Gaines, but then Mac went to jail, and then Perez went to jail. And those are the three closest confidants of no, uh, Light, is what some people say. But maybe the closest confidant of sure was Buntry, okay. Heron. Heron got killed first over Fairfax and Washington, got shot 17 times broad daylight. Buntry got killed broad daylight in Compton at 2 o'clock. Okay, guys on a bicycle, <laughs> did a, a bicycle drive by and killed him. Reggie Wright Sr. was the target. They thought it was Reggie Wright Jr. The car that they were in, the SUV, was registered to Reggie Wright Jr. Hey, this is a shout out to all y'all corrupt motherfuckers that are involved in all this bullshit. And I really just want to say thank you all you corrupt motherfuckers because if you guys would have just kept quiet we'd never know half of what we know about y'all corrupt motherfuckers and excuse all the profanity in this but there's nothing else to say about people who swear an oath to uphold the law and to do the right thing and then don't do the right thing and there's a saying Loose lips sink ships. And y'all are dry snitching on yourself to a minimum. But you're actually snitching on yourselves too. Because the more you guys get out there and start to tell these stories, the more we know. The more we find out. The more we start looking at all the pictures. The more that we start looking at the video. And we see y'all motherfuckers. We know that you were at the MGM. And how do we know that? Well, there's a Compton City official that saw you at the uh, Bruno fight. So he knew you guys were working for uh, the MGM, doing off-duty security. And there you are on the video. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of people now that are in Compton. You guys used to be there every day. They saw you and they know what you look like and what you looked like back then more importantly but all y'all motherfuckers 
you had to rob people, you had to steal their drugs, you had to go in there and raid the bookie joints, you guys had to do all this crazy shit. You guys had to run the hookers that were in Compton, the massage parlors, you guys had to run the seventh floor of the hotel where you guys had the hookers, and that's where you were getting your money. And then you guys were going out raiding all those houses. Well, we're just taking your guns. If we find a gun, we're going to take it. And you were selling those guns, and you were making money. And you were making money by robbing drug dealers. And you were making money by dealing dope. And so here we have a big pork chop called Death Row Records. And y'all figured that you were just going to take down this score and nobody was going to notice. You're going to be able to cover it up with the DA's office, cover it up with judges and all kinds of crazy shit. And even the Compton PD sent them off a helicopter. The good idea. And you know what? It all worked until y'all started talking. But the one thing we know about people that are in positions of power, they don't like to be embarrassed. And y'all are starting to embarrass them. And when you embarrass them, what's going to happen? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. They don't want to be caught. And they have bigger money at stake than what you all gave them. You all gave them pocket change compared to what they got going on. You think they're going to just let this whole thing slide? No, that's not going to happen. But we're going to dig into something. And two of the corrupt cops wrote a book. And in their book, I want to read to you a segment because it's very telling. So here it is. I'm going to read it to you. Months later, they were back in the undercover van doing another reverse sting, this time at the 300 block of Magnolia. It was the middle of summer and unbearably hot inside the van. Two other officers, Bruce Fralish and Fred Reynolds, were in the van assisting Tim and Bob. This time, when the buyers pulled off after making their purchases, they were intercepted by marked vehicles at either Ole and or Acacia Street. A nice cold beer would sound good right now, someone said. You motherfuckers want some beer, Fred Reynolds replied. I'll get you some beer. Fred Reynolds was a great cop. He was a black guy from Detroit, light-complexioned and funny, big and stocky, with a good head on his shoulders. He wore glasses. And that was, uh, and he was a self-proposed, professed ladies' man. When he said he could get the guy some beer, they went in on him, disputing his words. Fred was determined to prove them wrong. He got on the phone with his girlfriend, sweet-talking her into bringing the beer. The guys laughed. You're so full of shit. Fred hung up the phone with a broad smile. You, just you motherfuckers, wait. Fifteen minutes later, Fred's phone rang. Fred opened the door as his girlfriend walked up to the van. She handed him a brown bag full of the Coronas and left. The guys all burst into laughter. Fred tossed each of those guys a bottle of ice-cold beer. He looked in the bag. That bitch didn't bring us any limes. The guys thought he was joking. He wasn't. Reynolds called his girlfriend again. We need some limes. Ten minutes later, there was a knock on the van door. There was Fred's girlfriend with a bag full of limes. She handed them to him and left. The guys laughed hysterically. Fred, you're the man. Five minutes later, they were guzzling down Coronas. Looks like we have a customer, Bruce said. Someone was coming to buy drugs. Bruce radioed a description of the buyer's car. Inside was an older black male. The van was facing eastbound against the south curb line. The buyer's car headed westbound on Magnolia. Just before the buyer's car arrived at Oleander, a takedown unit pulled up and blocked it from moving forward. The car slammed on the brakes and came to a stop. The driver threw the car into reverse. 
taking off at a high speed. The car was speeding towards the van, fishtailing and swerving to the side. It lost control and slammed into the undercover van doing 40 miles per hour. The guys inside the van went flying. So did the beer. While the suspect was immediately taken into custody, Tim, Bob, Fred, and Bruce hopped out. Checking out the damage, the van was fucked up. Beer was everywhere. Jeff Newsman, the sergeant in charge of the narcotics unit, was already en route. The guys were trying to figure out what to do. They'd been drinking on a job. How were they going to hide it? They spotted a crackhead pushing a shopping cart. Hey, you want some bottles? The man came over. We need you to get these bottles of beer out of here as quick as you can. The man gathered up the beer and left happy. Sergeant Newsman pulled up just as the guy was pushing his cart away. The guys were in a faux panic. They reeked of Coronas. They all kept their distance as Sergeant Newsman shook his head, looking at the damaged van. The guys tried to contain their laughter, still processing what had just happened. It was still hot, and once again they were clean out of beer. Ha 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 ha! Isn't this such a funny story? Oh, wait a minute. I'm not really laughing, to be honest with you. And I know, okay, what's the big deal? It's just a bunch of cops on a stakeout drinking on the job. I mean, it's really not a big deal, right? Well, let's look at the pattern of behavior. And let's look at it uh, in conjunction with some of the interviews that we did in, like, Big Spender. Well, what happens? Hey, we're just drinking on the job. It's not a big deal. Well, now we know something about these cops. We know that they're willing to put their oath on the line and compromise themselves. So what's next? Drinking on the job leads to, well, you know, it's just a $50 bill. Maybe we just buy lunch with it. And then next thing you know, hey, you know, I need a grand because I got somebody that's like, you know, in dire straits and they'll never notice this drug money. And then pretty soon it's like we got to take the whole stack of drug money. And then before you know it, we're dealing drugs. We're engaging in murder for hire. We're engaged because what's the difference if you've killed one person What's the difference between killing 20 and killing one? It's the same life sentence. I mean, so, you know, once you've done murder for hire, it's really not a big deal to kill one more, two more, three more. And especially when you can get the DAs to cover for you, when you can get judges to cover for you, you know, when you get the system turned on itself, which is what, you know, Suge Knight has been accused of, because he rented a DA's house and whatnot, because there were cops that were around death row records all the time. Not that he had anything to do with them, because he tried to stay away from the police as much as he could. No, who was the go-between? Death Row Dave told us Reggie was the go-between, between Suge and all kinds of crazy shit. And he also said there was cash around like you can't believe. Why was there cash around? Because there was drugs that were being dealt out the back door. Now, I can only imagine that when you're putting out hit records, that that's kind of a full-time job. So I would almost bet that Suge was focused on the business side of Death Row Records and all that scandalous, crazy music business, money laundering shit that goes on in the music industry was probably being handled by somebody else but he gets blamed for Suge. And these corrupt cops, they have told us how they are. They put it in a book. They didn't dry snitch on themselves. They snitched on themselves. And one thing that we learn, the corrupt cop channel are these channels that are out there where everybody just seems to go. They always go to the same channels because it's all being orchestrated behind the scenes. And you see that people that go on these channels get hemmed up into cases. Well, let's look at the pattern of behavior. We got cops that are supposed to be on a stakeout, right? And 
they're giving away their position by having somebody come over to them and, like, knock on the van door. That's got to be a huge, uh, you know, departure from protocol because they're on a stakeout. This is, like, could be dangerous, right? Then what could happen? If somebody sees that they're on a stakeout, that van could easily get shot up. And that's Compton. That wouldn't be that much of a stretch, right? Well, they get her to come over and bring them beers. So that's got to be illegal, her bringing them beers, right? She's uh, helping them, uh, you know, violate the law. That can't be good for her, so they're getting her involved in it. They're drinking on the job. They're going to be impaired if they got to get into a gun battle. Yeah, God forbid they shoot somebody and they test for alcohol and they blow that they're, uh, that they're drunk while they're shooting somebody. And they've got suspects right there. It could easily go wrong. It's a drug deal that they're looking at, right? So there's all kinds of wrong with this. But then what do they do? They also cover up their crime. They are participating in a cover-up, and they're showing us how they do it because these are the way these cops are. All these cops that were in Compton that were part of this drug scheme, and we found out, you know, drug bust out of Tennessee. We found out that they were always involved in the drugs. This wasn't a new thing. Fred Miller said that uh, Reggie controlled the drug trade. And now we got these cops. Now, I'm going to show you a picture in this same book. It's them, and they're partying with all the DAs and with the judges. Now, do you think you could get a fair trial if you're facing these corrupt cops in a court of law? Every case that they ever touch should be overturned. You should take these names down, and you should use this as evidence, their own book, and go to court. Get these cases overturned that they all touched because these are corrupt motherfuckers. Now, the good cops, officer friendly out there who never had to cut a corner, never had to put their thumb on the scale of justice, that's who we really want to be up against when we're, when we're hemmed up in some kind of a legal battle. We want to be against somebody who's not, not afraid to do the right thing. And actually, if there's no real case to, you know, let it slide because, you know, whatever they thought is not true and they got to move on. But no, it's about getting a conviction. It's about winning. It's no longer about right and wrong. And when we have the judges and the DAs and the cops all partying together, nobody's ever going to get a fair shake. And this is the kind of shit that needs to stop. But enough about the preaching. Let's get back to this. So what do we have here? We have corrupt cops who, okay, it's not such a big deal. It's drinking on the job. Well, wait a minute. What is it? It's training day. What was the first thing? Have a beer. Oh, no. Smoke this crack pipe. Oh, no. Now you got to shoot somebody. And that's how this shit goes. We are escalating the behavior. We're testing. We want to see, will they drink a beer on the job? Hey, will they take a 20? Will they take a 50? Will they take a 100? Will they take a stack of cash? Will they take dope? Will they traffic in hookers and narcotics? And wait a minute, will they control the, uh, the seventh floor of the hotel with all the hookers there? Will they go rob... Uh, you know, bookie joints? Will they rob casinos? Will they rob... What will they do? What? Where's the governor that's on this? And that's what we see with this whole group of corrupt cops. They are operating under color of authority. They're having affairs and putting men's wives uh, first, and then they're putting those men in jail so that they could go have an affair with a woman. They're seeing a car that they want and they're going out and they're arresting somebody so that they can impound the car and buy it at auction. And this is the kind of shit that happens over and over. Now, when I was in border Mexico, I met somebody who was a corrupt cop down there and he was making big money running basically a, a vending route where he was 
getting paid all these stacks of currency for all the illegal activities that he was allowing to go on. And then he was taking his pinch and he was sending the rest on to the higher-ups. And it kind of makes you wonder who the higher-ups are when you got DAs and judges and what have you that are involved in these cases. And, you know, when you're trying to shut down the corrupt Compton Police Department and you have a uh, competing police uh, organization's chief of police coming to try and intercede to stop that from being shut down, you wonder if they're being paid with this illicit money, especially when you find out that same person was the one that hand-recruited the Rampton uh, Rampart Scandal Cops. And the Rampart Scandal Cops are knee-deep in all this death row stuff. It was a ring of people. It involved the sheriffs. It involved the uh, LAPD. It involved the corrupt Compton police. Now, how do we know that? Well, an off-duty sheriff let the shooters into the club the night Suge was shot at the one Oak. What did they scream? You killed Tupac. And then that same off-duty sheriff took the shooters to the airport the next day. Now, Russell and I were the only two that were actually having meetings with Dave Demersion. Nobody else was at the meetings except for Russell, me, and Dave Demersion. And what was it that we had uncovered? Not just the MGM tape, not just the confession letter, and not just a bunch of other stuff that we had compiled, information, the Tupac murder facts and whatnot. No, we found out about the off-duty sheriff that let the shooters into the club and drove them to the airport the next day. And from the time we disclosed that to the sheriffs, this became a cop thing. And Russell was then asked to show up alone. Carlin's no longer invited to the meeting. It's a cop thing. And so I wasn't able to go with him to the meeting. And we all know that tragically, Russell Poole died in that meeting. Why did Russell Poole die in that meeting? I don't think it was an aneurysm or a heart attack. I think it was because there was too much exposure for Russell Poole to continue to dig into this stuff. Already found out that the sheriffs were involved, and now the sheriffs tie to Compton PD, and we know that it ties to LAPD, so how big is this really? We were only starting to get a glimpse into how big this was. Russell had to go. And now we see the corrupt cops that get on the channel, the, the, the one big spokesperson channel, and we see that there are certain channels out there that are corrupt cop channels. And if you go on those channels, you're one of the corrupt cops. Y'all should learn from this. Loose lips sink ships. And y'all with the loose lips are about to sink your own ship. If that's the case, did, Pac, did Tupac life mean anything? Because they never saw that case. Sometimes if you saw the first case, you might have saw the second case. But that never happened, correct? Yep. But he did testify reluctantly. The death row records security chief Reggie Wright Jr. once told him, quote, we're going to get those mothers who downed Pac. A reportedly missing photograph and former police chief Bernard Park's daughter came up during testimony today in the wrongful death lawsuit filed against the city by murder rap star Biggie Small's mother. Uh, that to me was probably another motive for Chief Parks to want to squash a lot of the information. There was an effort to, to keep a lot of the information away from the public. This declaration from a jailhouse informant named Kenny Boagney links crooked LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of rap star Biggie Smalls. Okay. Right, you see, Suge was willing to say, I didn't know those two cops, but maybe Reggie knew them. Never met those dudes, they never worked for me. They knew Reggie right. They didn't know me. You always say, okay. those are Reggie people. <laughs> And Reggie was fast to say, I didn't know them either. I was just interested in why he would point the finger at Suge so quick. 
He wouldn't say it to you, but he definitely pointed it. We call that dry snitching. That Perez told how he worked security for Death Row Records the night Biggie Smalls was assassinated, and how he and Mac used cell phones to set up the hit. Boagney now says he was instructed by an LAPD detective to share his story with no one else investigating Biggie's murder. Judge Florence Marie Cooper says LAPD may be involved in what she calls deliberate and intentional concealment of information. Jailhouse informant Kenny Boagney ties former LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of rap star Biggie Smalls. LAPD has withheld reams of other evidence as well, including at least two other jailhouse statements implicating dirty cops Mack and Perez in Biggie's murder. A thousand pages of information were withheld describing Mack and Perez's involvement in Biggie's murder. Three different jailhouse informants who offered to wear a wire were all turned down by LAPD. A wire, say informants, that could have caught jailed officer Perez boasting about his involvement with death row records and the Biggie Smalls murder. Judge Florence Marie Cooper lists all the new information she says links former crooked LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of Biggie Smalls. The sheer volume of the information, says the judge, belies any LAPD argument that it comes from just another jailhouse informant. Murder is pretty simple. The first person you go after is the spouse. Perez and was all involved. They were trying to kill me too, but see, because Perez and, and, and Reggie was good friends, and Perez and Sarita and Reggie was great friends, and so all those three together was trying to plot. Those guys, if you go back and watch the film, they was already stalking Pac, watching it. So that just took the iceberg when something happened. But that was, there was a plan already to do something to him. Because Lando wasn't even the shooter, you know? He was actually a good kid, too, you know? I'm quite sure they, 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 they saw the first one, they saw the second one, because it's the same circle of people. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. Murder is pretty simple. The first person you go after is the spouse. All the artists at Death Row was willing to come with me. David Mack worked for you, right? No, ma'am. Never? Never met him. Never heard of him. Didn't know who he was until the accusations that he possibly did work for me. And that's been investigated by LAPD and all of that. Hey, why would I want a paper trail when I never brought him around nowhere? So if I'm going to hide him in secret, you think I'm going I'm to let somebody catch a paper trail? They were paying cash by Snoop. Perez and was all involved. They were trying to kill me too. But see, because Perez and, and, and Reggie was good friends. And Perez and Sarita and Reggie was great friends. And so all those three together was trying to plot. How about Rafael Perez? Never heard of him until all the incidents happened. Those guys, if you go back and watch the film, they was already stalking Pac, watching him. So that just took the iceberg when something happened. But that was, there was a plan already to do something to him. So why does everyone keep telling me that David Mack was working for you? Yeah, I never heard that. You have never heard that? That he worked for me. I You've heard, never heard that? Wait a minute, uh, let me clear that up. I'm saying by anyone that's credible, that will work around there or anything. Um, like I said, that was all investigated by LAPD. And I turned over my payroll, everything. You always say, okay. those are Reggie people. <laughs> Atlanta wasn't even the shooter, you know? He was actually a good kid, too, you know? I'm quite sure they, 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 they saw the first one, they saw the second one, because it's the same circle of people. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. Same people, same circle of people. It have nothing to do with me, you know?